Hi, uh, good evening, friends. Uh, so today is a World Sepsis Day. So I thank Dr. Keshavari in having me for this uh, meet and uh, for this talk. Uh, so, uh, so I'll be talking on uh, this topic on a new molecule, innovative molecule EDTA. Uh, so what is the science and uh, evidence for the same? So in next about fifteen minutes, I'll take you through. So what is the burden of global antimicrobial resistance that we have? Antimicrobial resistance in India is it something for us to be worried about? And do do we need to have new tools in our armamentarium? And what are the basic mechanisms? So a broad overview on the antibiotic resistance mechanisms, and uh, and a bit about this molecule EDTA. Uh, so basically, it acts on a multifold, as you would see. So how is how is its effect as a resistance breaker? As an antibiotic potentiator, adjuvant, and the predominant effect is on breaching this biofilm, and it is effectiveness in uh, countering this biofilm, and uh, and its effectiveness in inhibiting the uh, antibiotic efflux mechanism that uh, that is demonstrated by the bacteria in inducing resistance. And we'll talk about the studies that are available until now on this molecule and a take-home message. So these are the. Brief contents that I would be covering in next fifteen minutes. So when we look at the human and economic cost of antimicrobial resistance, uh, so it is uh, uh, this is a two thousand fourteen data. If you see, there are seven hundred thousand deaths, uh, which is only behind uh, the cancer, which is the leading, followed by uh, diarrheal disease and road traffic accidents. So antimicrobial resistance is leading, uh, is one of one amongst the top uh, four leading causes of death, and. <clears throat> And if the resistance patterns continue the same way as it is in 2050, it is estimated that 10 million people would be dying of antimicrobial resistance, and uh, the trends uh, really indicate that the resistance patterns have not shown any slowing down, and it is only increasing. And this could lead to 10 million deaths every year, and this would have a huge impact on the GDP in uh, reducing it or affecting it by 2 to 3.5 percent, which is 100 trillion US dollars. So when you look at the spread of uh, antimicrobial resistance globally by 2050, so in Asia we have around 4.73 million, and in Africa it is 4.15 million, and then in Latin America followed by Europe and North America. And India, as we know, friends, is a hotbed for antimicrobial resistance. So we have this New Delhi metallobita lactamases, which has spread globally. It started in India in 2006, then spread to China in 2008. to europe in 2009 and to north america in 2010 so which means to say that, that there is a rapidity in the spread of these uh, resistance strains across the globe and with our increased global interconnectedness uh, there is only it's only going to increase and the spread also would become more and more rapid and this is indicated by the sales of carbapenem if you see india is amongst the leading countries in the sale of carbapenems and if you look at the total antibiotic consumptions this is something which we cannot be proud of uh, so we seem to be leading in the antibiotic consumption followed by china and usa so which is again not a good use uh, because the more we use antibiotics the more would be the antibiotic resistance that we would be inducing and we need more tools to counter this mechanism so now coming into the latest indian report so this came as a the data which came from the national action plan uh 2017 to 21 so if you look at the e coli uh, 61% of the e coli was found to be espl producers and when you when we looked at the car, uh, the klebsiella 31 to 51% of the klebsiella were carbapenem resistant klebsiella and when you look at pseudomonas 65% of them were resistant to septicidem and 42% of them were imipenem resistant and when you look at staphylococcus because staphylococcus burden uh, seemingly was less in asia or particularly in india compared to europe or america so you would see that the resistance to staphylococcus also has significantly increased from 29% in 2008 to 47% in 2014 and uh, when you look at staph salmonella typhi in uh, india 96.7% are resistant to nalidixic acid 37.9% are resistant to ciprofloxacin which is often used as a first line in uh, uh, salmonella typhi and the 7.3% are resistant to azithromycin and 3.4% of salmonella typhi are mdr resistant so this is the sort of a uh, latest sort of a data that we have on the resistant pattern of commonly occurring bugs that we treat in icu 
and whether uh, now the question arises now last past two years we have been busy with covid and whether covid has had any any impact on the antimicrobial resistance so this is a good paper that came out looking at the impact of covid on amr and it showed that coronavirus has significantly increased the secondary bacterial infections in the patients and understandably we know friends uh, this is due to increased steroid usage and uh, other immunosuppressants that we use the risk of secondary bacterial infections has significantly increased and this has uh, in fact had an impact on increasing the death and worsening of ERDS in these patients and increased antibiotic usage in covid unnecessarily indiscriminately i am sure all the friends here would agree that many at times antibiotics are thrown in inappropriately increased use of antibiotics also has led to increased amr in specifically in covid so covid has really not changed the dynamics in fact i would say covid has worsened our rapidity of spread of uh, resistant organisms so very briefly we we'll look into the second aspect so what are the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance so there are two broad categories when you look at it so you have a natural resistance and then you have an acquired resistance in acquired resistance there are it is a multimodal way that bacteria develop the resistance to antimicrobials what is the genetic methods so these are mediated by chromosomal and extra chromosomal mechanisms so biochemical mechanisms are typically dependent on the type of antibiotics that we use so a limited reuptake of the antibiotics uh, that one is using would lead to antimicrobial resistance or modification of the target site on which the antibiotic acts also leads to resistance or inactivity so there are enzymes that inactivate the antibiotics and that leads to antimicrobial resistance and you have this efflux of antibiotics that basically antibiotics are thrown out by the bacteria by the efflux mechanisms so the way we would approach this resistance also has to be multimodal so we need to address this efflux mechanism so we need to prevent the inactivation of it and we need to develop modalities we do not alter the modification of the target site so this so these are in brief the different uh, ways the uh, the bacteria develops resistance and we need to have tools to counter this so what is the solution so now we have this edta which is available as in two strengths 37.5 mg and 75 mg so we need to see whether this holds promise as a tool to minimize this antimicrobial resistance that's why we are here to talk about this so the the claim is that it is a resistance breaker it does reduce the resistance it does potentiate the action of antibiotic and it is a good adjunct for antibiotic so another important aspect when i was reviewing the literature about edta is it has a good effect on breaking this biofilm or uh, penetrating this biofilm or minimizing the formation of this biofilm and edta has a impact on inhibiting these efflux mechanisms or the efflux inhibition uh, because this is a mechanism where bacteria uses to throw out the antibiotic uh, so edta has a way in inhibiting this uh, efflux pumps or efflux mechanism so how does that happen we'll see in couple of slides so antibiotic resistance breakers um, uh, typically happens by edta by two mechanisms the class 1 effect is by reducing the minimum inhibitory concentration of the antibiotic and that many uh, there are in vitro studies which has demonstrated that edta when used along with the antibiotic acts synergistically to reduce the mic levels and class 2 mechanism of antibiotic resistance breaker is by host defense mechanism basically it modifies the enzyme inhibitor and then it enhances the uh, membrane permeability of antibiotics so by doing this edta may have a role in potentiating the mechanism of antibiotic and how does this uh, edta help in minimizing or inhibiting the uh, the efflux pumps so these are the efflux pumps so basically you have basically as the name suggests these are pumps which throw out the antibiotic from the bacteria which bacteria very conveniently uses and as the name sounds edta is a chelating agent so it chelates the zinc ions and magnesium ions and these ions which i will show in the subsequent slides are the ions that efflux pumps need for its functionality so the efflux pumps basically use the zinc ions and magnesium ions which are positively charged ions to activate these pumps to basically it's a fuel for the pumps which act as an engine to throw out the antibiotic so by edta by chelating this or by inhibiting this basically the pumps would not have fuel to function 
to throw out this antibiotic. So that is the proposed mechanism. And, uh, and EDTA has an effect in minimizing the formation of biofilms or improving the penetrability. So this is a typical schematic diagram of biofilms. So you would have a lot of bacteria encased and you would have this biofilm formation around this bacteria and the other debris. And this would prevent the action of antibiotic or the inflammatory cells reaching out to the bacteria uh, and uh, eliminating it. Uh, so, and this biofilm typically consists of proteins, polysaccharides, and small molecules. So, this is a very important figure, very nicely illustrated as to how EDTA acts. So, you have this lipopolysaccharide sort of a structure covering the bacterial cell wall, and you have this positively charged and negatively charged ions uh, which sort of integrate to form uh, the biofilm. And the, as I said, the fuel that is needed, so calcium ions and magnesium, the positively charged ions are needed to form a bond with this negatively charged uh, to create a biofilm. Basically, calcium and magnesium stabilizes these negatively charged ions by creating these uh, nice bridges and bonds and help in formation of the biofilm. So when EDTA is used, it chelates, it's a chelating agent. So it removes this calcium and magnesium. So it do, so these negatively charged ions would not have this positively charged calcium, magnesium and zinc to form the biofilm. And basically your lipopolysaccharide will not be left with any of these negatively charged creating bonds with the positively charged. So this is the way uh, EDTA is shown to be effective in uh, minimizing the formation of biofilm. Uh, so this is a, if you remember this figure, uh, uh, the clarity would be there that how EDTA is helpful in preventing of uh, prevention of the formation of biofilms. And uh, EDTA is a good adjunct for antibiotics in enhancing its, uh, enhancing its potency in a very synergistic way. So the other important ways the EDTA acts is, as I said, by improving the membrane permeability by, or like if you remember that slide, it acts by two mechanisms. One is to reduce MIC, one is to improve the host defense, uh, host defense mechanism by improving the permeability, membrane permeability. And it acts as antibiotic buffer and it improves the sensitivity of the bacteria to the antibiotic. And it, uh, it, uh, EDTA does have a direct antimicrobial effect as well, because you would remember that in propofol, EDTA is used. So it has some antimicrobial effect as a direct antimicrobial effect as well. So these are some other ways in which EDTA acts as a good uh, synergistic tool as an adjunct to the antibiotic. So coming to pharmacology, so I have around three minutes, so I should be able to cover. So pharmacology absorption, EDTA is not absorbed orally, it is parenteral IV or IM. Distribution is predominantly in the extracellular fluid. Metabolism is a chelating agent, so it, uh, and it gets excreted. Elimination, 50% of it is excreted in one hour, and 90% is excreted within seven hours. And as I said, the dosage available is 75 milligram and 37.5, so the maximum daily dose is three grams per day, uh, which means you, uh, one could use 75 milligram four times if you want to use a higher dose, or 75 milligram, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, two times. So it is three grams per day is the maximum dose for five to seven days. So indications, uh, as, as this molecule is an adjunct to the antibiotic, pretty much it could be used as an adjunct with most antibiotics in any of these life-threatening infections one would be dealing with. And as I said, the pathogenic activity that one would be looking at targeting is all the E. coli, so the coliforms, pseudomonas, staphylococcus, Acinotobacters, these are typical bugs we see in ICU, along with Klebsiella. And these are the resistant bugs which uh, are NDM producers, ESBL producers, and metallobetalactomyces producers. So you would uh, ideally choose this agent to target these enzyme producers or these resistant pathogens, which we commonly encounter in ICU. So supporting articles, very quickly, I would see, um, I have to confess here, there are no big clinical data. So most data is confined to in vitro studies, looking at its effectiveness in reducing the MIC. Very quickly, I'll take you through uh, this particular Indian study, where if you see this was looked in Klebsiella, and they looked at the resistant patterns came significantly down when antibiotics were combined with EDTA. Uh, the resistant isolates were significantly less as compared to the group where it was not. See, this is the group where only antibiotics were used. This is the group where antibiotic belongs with EDTA, and you could see the resistance patterns coming down. And this is a data of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again, here, 
number of resistant isolates came down as uh, when EDTA was added as compared to the group which had only antibiotics. So this was a study from Egypt uh, where they showed the biofilm formation and antibiotic susceptibility. As you would see, it was significantly less across the antibiotic group um, with re by, by adding uh, EDTA as an adjunct, reduced the MIC. And the highest inhibitory effect was found with meropenem at 81.6% uh, and with nitroferentine 61.4%. So this is the sort of a percentage breakup. Uh, after EDTA was used, the biofilm negativity happened in 45.8%. In this group, it happened in 76.8 and 69.4. So there was a reasonable uh, effect on mitigating or minimizing the formation of biofilm. In This was, a, again, an in vitro study. So this was one study, again, looking at its effectiveness on efflex pump inhibitor, because as I said, it has a effect in... Um, uh, inhibiting the efflex mechanism uh, by chelating the zinc and the uh, calcium ions. So you would see here the efflex uh, pump inhibition happened significantly because this is without EDTA, it was more than 520. If you see the numbers there, this is without EDTA. With EDTA, the efflex uh, inhibition happened quite significantly in in vitro studies. And this is the way the biofilm looks uh, in the antibiotics used. So with ceftriaxon sulbactam, this is the biofilm formation. This is with piperacillin tazobactam. This is with meropenem, and this is with the control group. So this is how the typical electronic microscopic view of biofilm. So this was another study, observational study done between 2018 in 94 patients. They found meropenem when combined with EDTA, there was 50% reduction in MIC and improved the sensitivity. So these are, so as I said, I have to confess, all these four studies are in vitro studies. The last study, they did look at clinical indicators also, uh, but mainly predominantly it was look, looking into the MIC levels. So the take home message, antimicrobial resistance is a reality and India is at the forefront of, the, uh, of uh, very high proportion of patients developing this antimicrobial resistance infections in ICU. And uh, we need to understand the mechanism of AMR is very complex, it's multifactorial. Obviously, we have no influence on genetic mechanisms, but we have influence on biochemical mechanisms uh, where inappropriate usage of antibiotics leads to antibiotic resistance by limited reuptake, inactivation, efflux mechanism, and modification of target sites. And EDTA seems to be at least, uh, uh, you know, high, uh, with regards to scientific hypothesis, it appears that it has some effect, uh, it has a good effect on uh, biofilm, minimi minimizing the biofilm formation, inhibiting the uh, efflux mechanism and antibiotic uh, resistance breaker and a good adjunct to the antibiotics. So there are four studies and uh, it is all in vitro studies. So what I would uh, conclude at the end of my talk is we need a good in vivo clinical studies which would add a huge value to this new drug EDTA to convince us that uh, using this in a clinical scenario, whether it has it has had an impact on influencing favorable outcome, especially in these MDR infections in ICU. Uh, so the reason I'm giving this talk is we are, uh, we are uh, doing a pilot study on this EDTA uh, in around uh, 30 to 40 patients supported by uh, uh, you know, the Fusion Pharma, which is producing this drug. Uh, and then we would be comparing it with our historical cohorts to see whether usage of this antibiotic uh, with ED, uh, usage of EDTA with antibiotics in sepsis patients with MDR infections, whether it led to favorable clinical outcome. Uh, hopefully, we'll come out with some data in, uh, in the next talk that I would give on this. Uh, so thank you all. So I would end with this beautiful quote. We don't grow when things are easy. We grow when we face challenges. So these molecules are something that uh, needs to be considered, especially in these challenging times where we are increasingly dealing with uh, antimicrobial resistance. So thank you one and all.